This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hi there, I'm Shelby, and I'd like to welcome you to this very special episode of Scare You to Sleep, written by kids. We've got werewolves, zombie frogs, banshees, and so much more. So grab some hot chocolate and a caramel apple, sit back, and let's get spooky. Sienna F., age four and a half. The eyeball pokes itself, and it comes alive when it pops out of the forehead. Then, a second eyeball pops out, and I can't see anymore. It then goes into a floor that is lava. Then, the second one falls in the lava. Then I scream really hard, Ah! I then lose my breath, and I can't breathe anymore. Then, I die. Liana F., age four and a half. I'm at a farmer's market, and I fall into a giant eyeball, and it hurts. I fall into a black hole when falling into the eyeball. Then I fall into mommy's head. Then I fall into a giant chair that explodes. Then I fall into a giant squid and get tiny. Then I fall onto a table in an airplane. Then I wake up and say, ah, what am I doing? I'm on an airplane. Claire, age five. Once upon a time, there was a little bat and his friends, and they didn't know where they were going. But standing right behind them was another giant bat. So the little bat and his friends ran into the cave, but his friends walked out. So little hamster says, Bat hasn't been back in ages. The friends were so, so, so worried about Little Bat because he was their best friend. You wouldn't want to lose a best friend, would you? What happens next? Oh no, the pages are ripped out. What are we going to do? Mabel, age six. Have you ever thought about just how scary zombies are on Halloween? Well, I've got a story for you about the scariest most haunted zombie frog I've ever seen. One spooky Halloween night, me and my mama and daddy were trick-or-treating. We walked past the scary old creek behind our house. There, by the water, was a tiny tombstone. It read, Here lies a silly old frog. He was the oldest frog. Well, just then, a little hand came up out of the dirt and up comes a zombie frog. He had a skeleton hand, his eyeball was hanging out, and he was covered in flies. He doesn't eat the flies because he is dead, I guess, so they just fly around. The frog spotted us and shouted, Boo! Give me your treats! I said, I know who you are. You are my pet frog, Hopper. I was wondering where you had gone. Uh Uh-huh. The silly frog's plan was over. He pulled off his zombie costume. Hopper said, Okay, you got me. I just wanted to spook you. I have plenty of treats anyway. As we walked home together, Hopper ate up all of his flies. I ate a sucker, and we had a frightful, creepy night. Happy Halloween, Ribbit. Clark Bailey, age six. The mom, the kid, and the werewolves on Halloween night. Once upon a time, there was a kid named Jace. Every night he would sleep with his mom. Every night he would hear a howl outside the window and at the full moon. On Halloween night, he asked, Mom, what was that sound outside? Then mom said, I don't know. Should we go trick-or-treating or not? Jace said, Yes. 
So he dressed up to be a wolverine. The moon was a full moon and he heard another howl. They went trick-or-treating and Jace peeked into the woods while trick-or-treating. In the woods he saw, like, a werewolf nose. He saw werewolf claws. The claws were long and like the sharpest things in the world. So then he asked his mom if they could leave and go back to their house where they would lock the door. Mom said, why? And Jay said, because I saw a werewolf nose in the woods. The mom sniffed the air and then she turned into the werewolf. Her werewolf claws were really sharp too. Jace ran all the way to the house and locked the door from the inside. Then, the mother werewolf climbed up to the roof. She scratched the roof a bunch of times with her sharp claws, and the roof fell in. The house crumbled. Jace decided to sniff the air, and he turned into a werewolf. Just then, the mom turned back normal. So then, Jace the werewolf chased after his mom with his claws that were as sharp as alligator's teeth. The mom called a taxi, and the yellow taxi drove her away as fast as it could go. Jace howled at the moon. After that, he sniffed the air and turned back into a little boy. But he kept his sharp claws. He lived happily ever after. His mom came home. The end. This next junior horror author wished to remain anonymous and with an unknown age. The Smiler. Okay, so this is a true story. But yeah, basically, one time me and my friend were in the back country, like the woods, and we were playing a game when I couldn't see her. So I started whistling. Then she came sprinting out of the forest, and I am like, what the heck is going on? She's like, oh good, I thought it ate you. I'm like, what ate me? And here's the description of what she saw. A seven foot tall creature, a tealish green color, its arm growing out of its back without facial features, and a mouth big enough to swallow a dog. I grab a hatchet and a chicken out, lol, but she comes running and she says, run! I ask why, but she doesn't say. Sadly, that's the end. Cora Bailey, age eight. The Three-Headed Halloween Dog Once there was a Great Dane dog named Peanut, and every Halloween he turned into a three-headed dog monster. Each head was big with pointed ears. The three sets of eyes were yellow, and they glowed in the dark. Jacy, the dog's owner, loved to trick-or-treat. She thought to take her dog trick-or-treating with her. Jacy was so excited, she didn't even notice when her dog turned into the three-headed dog monster. The dog started to talk. It growled at all the crowd of trick-or-treaters. Everyone, give me your candy. Almost everyone threw their candy at the dog. The dog slobbered all over but caught the candy in its snapping jaws and mean teeth. But one little boy did not throw candy. Instead, he was brave and walked up to the three snarling heads. This angered the dog and all of its eyes glowed even brighter. The boy hopped on the scary looking dog's back and he petted it. That made the dog breathe easier and calm down. Two of the mean heads disappeared and it was just a regular Great Dane again. So now, every Halloween when someone is mean to the dog, It grows a second and a third head with glowing eyes and tries to steal everyone's candy. But if someone decides to be nice to him, he changes back to a regular dog. The end. Marshall, age eight. The Dog Demon. I woke up in the middle of the night. It was 2.23. I went to watch TV in the living room. But I didn't see my dog. He was always following me to go watch TV. By the way, I lived on a farm. As I was saying, when I sat on the couch, I started to hear whimpering and scratching at the door. But then I remembered, I never let my dog outside. I was curious, so I went to my door and my dog was sitting right there at the bottom of the door. I looked up 
and there was a three foot tall dog thing. It was sitting. I think it would be seven feet standing up. I immediately screamed at the top of my lungs. I turned around and saw my real dog. I grabbed him and ran upstairs. It was like a demon making an illusion to try to get me to come out. And that's it. Bye, friends. Caden, age eight. There's a little girl who loved playing around outside. One night, her mom and her heard a knock at the door. Her mom walked to the door. There was an old man standing there. The old man asked her to help. His car broke down. Her mom went out with him. Then, the lights went out. And a couple seconds later, the door opened back up. The door creaked. And there was a black shadow. Then, there was a terrible scream. The lights went back on, and the girl couldn't go to sleep. She had the feeling someone was watching her. Later that night, her mom came back. She said that the old man's car had a black shadow thing in it, and they used a flashlight to get out of it. The girl said to her mom, There was a creak of the door, and a black shadow came in. What did it look like? It had long claws like a bear, but a small head like a turtle, and it had little wings, and it screamed. The lights went off, and then it disappeared. They both couldn't sleep, so they slept in the same bed that night, watching Dora the Explorer to make them unscared. They soon fell asleep, and the little girl heard the same creaking noise as when the black figure came in. She woke her mom up, and by the time she woke up, it was gone. They said, how about we stay awake tonight? Because one of them fell asleep. It was the old man. He snuck into their house and he was sleeping in the attic. He was the black figure. Because when her mom found the thing in the car, he was gone. And when she was walking back, he disappeared again. When the door creaked, he was coming into the house. When they went up there, there was a bloody knife on the floor and a cut off foot. The little girl screamed and the old man woke up. He picked up the knife and he started to walk towards them. Their dad came home from the military. He had a gun in his hand and he shot the old man. The end. This is by Lyra S. The Story of Blondie. Once upon a time, there was this little girl that was very nice. Her name was Rosabelle. She liked to wear all red clothes. She was an orphan, and the caretaker let a doctor do experiments on the kids. Rosabelle got injected with something weird, but she broke out of the orphanage and ran away. Her hair and body started to change as she ran until she bumped into a woman. The woman took her home, but to keep the orphanage from taking her away, they started calling her Blondie. They took her to another doctor to see if they could cure her. Blondie wore a skirt a blue and green striped shirt, and she had dirty blonde hair and a big round face. The doctors kept trying to cure her, but failed. A few days passed by, and the woman found more kids who had run away, but they were all starting to mutate. All of them were taken to a good doctor, but they still couldn't figure out a cure. One night, while Blondie was sleeping, a mysterious person broke into her house and placed a necklace around her neck. When she woke up, she felt really weird and saw the pendant had a shape like an ink drop on it. She felt like there was a mind control on her and it kept telling her to do bad things. She fought it off, but they still came back. She got so scared she'd hurt the woman that she decided to run away. But as she ran down the street, the bad doctors caught her. As she tried to get away, Something came out of her necklace and killed the doctors, but she didn't see what because her eyes were closed with fear. She grabbed a ragged cloth from the doctors and put it on to disguise herself. So now she wanders the streets alone in a creepy wrapped cloth outfit with a strange powerful necklace around her neck. Nobody knows what else the necklace might do. So, if you ever spin around three times and chant, Rosabelle, 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 
it will call her to you, and she will get you. Sawyer Jedlica, age nine. The White Thumb. One day, a man and his wife were talking and reading. The man's wife wanted to take a walk and look at houses. Their house was in awful condition. She wanted to get a nice house. She never liked the skeleton painting in the basement. So, they took a walk for a bit until the man's wife got tired and wanted to go back home. He took her back home and told her he would keep looking at houses. He began walking, and as he went on, he felt worried. He felt someone was watching him. He looked around. He started to walk back home, then speed walked, then jogged, and then eventually, he ran. He was about to walk inside when he heard a scream. He burst inside to see his wife on the floor, dead. She had something in her hand. It was a thumb, a white thumb. He thought and thought, and then he remembered the painting. He ran downstairs and looked at the painting and saw the skeleton was missing its thumb. Ella Barber, age nine, almost ten. When they come. One night in October 2023, two 12 year old girls named Storm and Galaxy were playing a zombie apocalypse video game called When They Come. When they stopped playing and went outside, they realized that they had been sucked into the horrible world of the video game, and there was a real disease that had spread across their town. Running into the streets, they saw a slasher zombie holding a large knife and chasing a woman. They were also attacker zombies hiding in the bushes and cars then jumping out and mauling people. Some zombies even had spikes coming out of their faces and heads. Making their way through the chaos, Storm and Galaxy ran into other 7th graders from their school, West Weird Junior High, and invited them all to hide at Galaxy's giant house. Kayla, Mackenzie, Jack, and James all joined the two best friends. Once safe at the house, the preteens built a massive base and found ways to survive. Food, weapons, and supplies were foraged from the school and abandoned houses. They even managed to find some working cars that their friend Jack taught everyone how to drive. On a supply run, Storm and Galaxy got bitten by a zombie. But after multiple months, they still hadn't turned. They showed them they were immune to the virus. They tried to cure their friends by giving them their own blood, but it didn't work, and the blood had terrible effects on their friends. Some people's skin blistered and burned off. One by one, the survivors died due to infection. What did we do wrong? Galaxy cried after losing the last of their friends. I don't know, said Storm, but we should put on some PJs and go to sleep. The two girls put on baggy, oversized gray pajamas and went to sleep, not knowing it would be their last night alive. The next morning, Storm decided to try one last attempt to cure the illness and asked Galaxy to stab her in the heart, thinking that would release a chemical that would end the virus. Galaxy plunged a knife into her best friend's chest and sobbed while holding her corpse. She never found a cure. Galaxy Voltage Monroe stood in front of her 7th grade English class and said, Thanks for listening to my story. That's the end of my report. She sat back down in her seat next to her bestie, Storm, thinking, Aren't dreams weird? The girls high-fived. Penelope, age 10. The Woods. Hi there. My name is Tom, and I think Halloween is the best holiday because me and my friends get to wear masks and then egg people's houses, throw toilet paper at people we hate, and best of all, we steal people's candy so we don't have to say that stupid phrase, trick or treat. It just sounds so stupid when you say it. One year, we had consequences for our actions. It was Halloween of 1995. We were doing the usual pranks, but we forgot our masks, so everyone knew who we were. 
The person we were pranking was our gym teacher. We quickly ran away as fast as we could because he is as fast as a cheetah. Anyway, we found an abandoned theme park and hid there for a while until the man was gone. We started to get weird vibes about the park. It was like we were being watched. There should not have been anyone else there besides us, or so we thought. We started to walk home, and all the lights were going out behind us. But when we turned around, no one was there. When I got home, I heard someone knocking on my door. It was midnight, so I very slowly opened the door. But no one was there, so I went back to bed. As soon as I got to bed, the knocking started again. Only this time, they were banging on the door. Bang, bang, bang. I rushed down to get the door, but no one was there. I slammed the door shut, turned around, and there he was. A clown waiting to attack. I couldn't move because I didn't want him to attack me. But when I closed my eyes and opened them, he was gone. The next day, I tried to call my friends. Neither of them answered, which was an odd behavior. When I went to one of their houses, the door was unlocked. I went inside, and there were pools of blood everywhere, and my friend's dead body on the floor. On the body was a note that said, You should know better. I was in shock. I didn't know what to do, so I got out of there. The same thing happened as my other friends, too, with the same note on it. I was too scared to call 911, so I went home afraid I was next. When I got there, the clown was at my door. He was sprinting toward me the whole time, chanting, Trick or treat! Over and over. And with a knife, he stabbed me in the heart. Marley, age 10. The Creature. It was a stormy night, and it struck midnight, and the creature had awakened. Jeremy! screamed Annie. Jeremy pulled up his wrist to check the time slowly. Then he yelled, Honey, it's midnight. Give me a minute. Then he thought for a second and yelled again, Wait, Annie, are you okay? There was no answer. Then he heard footsteps. He ran out of bed, the blanket in the air, and he ran to the door and slammed it shut. But the second before he slammed the door shut, he saw a glowing red eye. Then he locked the door as hard as he could and ran to the closet and pulled an MK-47 out of the closet and then walked to his desk, grabbed his phone, and dialed 911. When the police came, the two kids were still asleep and Annie was dead. But Jeremy was still alive. Also, did I mention the creature was gone? Annika Johnson and Lisa Morgan. We are both 11. Deep Dark Ocean. A tongue comes out of the water. She tried to get away, but Zuri can't get away. She try and try. It sucked. Zuri was alone. Her family just stood there, watching, when they noticed the help. She got away, but it is still after her. The next day, she went on the boat. She was allowed to bring two friends on the boat. Everyone was jumping off the boat one by one. People went missing, and it was only Zuri and her two friends that were standing in the middle of the ocean. Zuri will always know it follows her everywhere. No one can see. She can't even see it. She felt it, but she can't see it. Every morning, Zuri had marks, had marks on her, and it was not there yesterday. It was never there. The friends became worried and terrified. They thought she was followed, and they guessed right after the friends felt it. The next day, they went around the ocean. They can't find the beach. Zuri did not move. Zuri was terrified. It was like her life was flashing before her eyes, but no one she was looking at, the water. When the friends looked, a megalodon came out of the water. Everyone freaked out. The friends moved but her, but she turned around, and it was like the world had stopped. The megalodon had his sharp, glistening teeth on her, and his tongue scraped around her, and she just stood there, waited for her fate. The family freaked out, told her to move, but did not move. She got sucked under the water. But she came back up. She was crying. The friends helped her back up on the boat. She was shaking, terrified about it. She went to bed, still shaking. The next morning, there was food on the boat. 
So they made breakfast around the afternoon. The three was talking. Kraken came out. The two friends moved, but one friend did not. Zuri got sucked under. She did not come back up. The friends became worried. Nora, said one of the friends. Y yes said Nora, scaredly. Skye began to cry. We'll miss you, Nora said, beginning to sob. The next day, Skye and Nora went out on a different boat. A couple hours passed by, then they start to see ink of some sort spilling out from underneath the boat. Nora went to the front of the boat to see what it was. Skye jumped off the boat to see what it was. Then, Nora heard a scream. She looked over the boat to see Skye not there. Skye, Skye, where are you? She screamed. Nora started to see a tentacle in the water. A kraken, she screamed, while speeding the boat up and sobbing. Sky and Zuri are dead, she said to herself quietly. A couple days later, at Skye's and Zuri's funeral, she sees these ghost-like figures. She waves at them, but then goes on with her as normal years later. She tells children Zuri's and Skye's story. The End Maddie, age 11 Hi, my name is Rose, but I have to go quick with my story. I am a babysitter, and I only watch one kid. Her name is Harley. She has told me that I am her favorite. So when I first left and told her that I would not be watching her anymore, she got very sad, but she was understanding. But when her parents invited me over, I felt that something was off, but I just shook the feeling off. Eventually, they asked me if I could help paint Harley's room, and of course, I said yes, but this was when I started to have a weird feeling. Harley was acting different. She was being a little weird and keeping to herself whenever her parents came into the room. She got mad and looked at me like it was the last time she would ever spend time with me. And two hours passed by and I finished painting one wall, but then I noticed something interesting. There was a trap door underneath her bed because we had to move it, but the parents just said that it was nothing. So I continued to clean and paint her walls, but then the parents started asking me weird questions like my parents' phone number and where I live, but I have been working for them for a while, so I felt comfortable, but then they asked me to paint the walls underneath her room, and they put me into the secret room from under her bed, and then Harley slowly came down, but then I started to feel really uneasy, because I feel like something was really wrong with Harley, and at this point, I was not ignoring my feelings, because this was really weird for them, and they closed the door on me and Harley and locked it. They called me from this device and said that I could never leave because Harley was too sad to see me go, and then I finally realized what was going on, but I am still locked in here right now. But then I searched Harley and her parents' first and last name, and it showed that they died three years ago, which was when I started working for them. I am still trapped with no escape, but now I know what was going through their heads. I hope you like the story, and save me. Carter, age 11. One night, me and my best friend had a sleepover at his house. We were in bed playing Fortnite. When the power went out, we instantly ran upstairs. His parents came rushing down. His brother and sister followed behind him. I was freaking out. His parents said he liked to sleep. All probably got knocked down somewhere. I said, okay. I was still a little freaked out, but we walked back downstairs and inside on our phones, and we heard a knock on the door. I started hiding. I knew that his parents were going to take care of it upstairs. I was scared, though. I heard the knock being wide open and the sound of a knife piercing the skin. Then, and screaming, me and my friend ran out the back door of the basement into the neighbor's yard. We went, ran to the woods behind his house, and we could see the figure following us. We kept on running and running. We ended up hiding behind a tree. We could hear its footsteps creeping up on us. My heartbeat was a thousand miles an hour. I could hear my friend's heartbeat, and then the footsteps got quieter after we could barely hear them. We started quietly creeping away. We were not going back to his house. After a while, we found an abandoned structure in the woods, and we camped there for the night. The next night, we began our long journey to my house. After about eight hours of walking, we arrived at my house and told my parents what happened. They asked if his brother and sister are fine. We said we didn't know. We didn't want to go back to that house ever again. Alice S. The Bloody Banshee My name is Liz, and this is the tale of the Bloody Banshee. In October of 2019, my sister Penny, my parents, and I were driving to my grandparents' house. At the time, I was 16, and my sister was 8. 
We were driving towards the town where my grandparents lived, when suddenly a storm hit. We heard a big pop and boom. The car started to swerve. Dad said, oh no. My mom saw a little flicker of light up ahead and said, hey, maybe we can pull over up there. Dad nodded and pulled over. Then we all got out of the car. My sister said, are we okay? Can we go now? Dad went to the right back side of the car and said, well, we popped a tire. It will take a while to fix this. Dear, maybe we can get help there. She pointed to the big old mansion next to us. Penny shivered and said, I'm scared. I looked at the scary building as my sister held tightly on my arm, but the rain was getting worse. We walked up the steps to the big brown door and knocked on it. The sound echoed inside the building. After a while, we heard footsteps, and the big brown door opened, and we saw a young woman wearing a maid's outfit. Hello, how are you? Do come in, sir and madams, she said. My dad told her about the car and who we were and asked if we could use the phone to call for a tow truck since our cell phones weren't working. The maid said, No, but you can stay here for the night if you like. That storm outside looks really bad. My name is Mary and I work here during the weekends. We have lots of rooms here after all. My parents thanked her and we unloaded the car. I had to go into a room with Penny because she was too scared to sleep in her own room. We had put all our stuff down. We went downstairs and had dinner. Afterwards, Mom said, It's time you get into bed. Twenty minutes later, we were ready for bed, and as we got into bed, we all decided to tell spooky stories. Mary went last and told us a story about the house we were staying in. A long time ago, the owners of this house were very rich. They were known as Count Kaysen and Countess Diana. One night around midnight, there was a scream from their bedroom. When the staff went to help them, they found the room empty and nobody could find them. In the morning, they were found in their beds, bloody and pale. Everyone had different ideas about what had happened. Some thought it was a vampire, others thought it was a murderer and still others said it was a sickness. But the old timers who lived in this area knew what it was. It was. Went the grandfather clock. Mary smiled and said, looks like it's time to go to sleep. Oh well, I'll tell you what it was tomorrow morning. Good night. My sister and I fell asleep. Later, my sister woke me up to say that there was a horrible screaming and shrieking coming from the hallway. I was tired and didn't want to get up, so I said, It's probably just the wind. We went back to sleep. My sister woke me up a second time saying, The shrieking is getting louder. Try to ignore it, I said in an annoyed voice, and we both went back to sleep. The third time, the noise was so loud, I woke up without my sister having to wake me up. I looked for her, but she was gone from her bed. So, I took a flashlight from my bag and stepped out into the hallway. We both screamed when I went around the corner and we bumped into each other. I had to go to the bathroom, she whispered to me after we recovered. I gave her a suspicious look and she finally admitted, Well... I also went to investigate. We both decided to go look for what was causing the noise. We walked out for a long time, but we saw nothing, and it was so cold, we returned to our room. As we opened the door, we saw a pale girl with dripping blood coming off her body. I covered my mouth, but my sister screamed, and the girl saw us. Her face twisted as her jaw dropped until it was whiter than humanly possible, and she let out a blood-curdling shriek. We ran, and she began to run after us. Help! My sister screamed, and I looked back to see that the girl had pulled my sister down by the leg and was trying to suck on her ankle. Suddenly, a frying pan hit the horrible creature and it let my sister go. 
I pulled her away, and both of us were screaming and crying. Mary had come to the rescue. Get back, you banshee! She shouted angrily. Banshee? My sister and I exclaimed. Run! Get out of here! Go! Do it now! Mary shouted, and we ran away as fast as we could. We went to our parents and we told them everything. At first they scoffed, but then we all heard more blood-curdling screaming. We all got our stuff and ran to the car. Luckily it had stopped raining and the storm was over, but it was still cold. My parents both put on a spare tire as fast as they could. We turned on the car and the noise must have been heard by the banshee because she floated out the window and began to chase after us. Dad floored it, but the car's tire spun in the mud. The banshee was gaining on us. Dad, go! My sister screamed. Oh no, you don't, said a familiar voice. We looked out the window to see Mary tackling the monster as we drove away. My sister cried and my parents sighed in relief that we had escaped. I was the only one who looked at the back window to see that words had been written across it in what looked like blood. It said, You haven't heard the whole story yet. Hey there, it's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing and you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps and rush dinners. Factors 2-minute meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant quality meals all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over mealtimes in the new year. Factor's no prep, no mess meals free up time otherwise spent on shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, they also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code scareyoutosleep50 at factormeals.com. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is Rocket Money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. 
Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Desmond Olguin, age 12. The Eternal Field. June was a bright kid. She absolutely loved reading books and playing outside. Her family lived in the countryside, with a small, peaceful neighborhood with plenty of wildlife. There were trees, plants, birds, flowers, and grass. June, sweetie, could you be a deer and get me an extra large pan in the attic? June's mom asked. Sure, mom, June said cheerfully. She put down her book and went to the attic. Then something was caught by June's eye. It was a book, written by... no name. It was a book that wasn't titled. It seemed ominous, and June loved ominous stories. So she got the pan and asked her mom about the book. Oh, I've never seen that book in my life. You should ask your father, June's mom said. Her dad said, No. I don't think I know this book. Go ask your mom. June knew what would happen if she kept on asking, so she left to read it by her favorite tree, slightly far from her house. Bye, Mom and Dad. Love you. June called as she left. She opened up the book. The book told a story about a group of kids who got lost in an endless time loop and slowly went insane, killing each other one by one. June personally thought the book was slightly scary, but she thought the scariest part was at the end, when it said, You can't escape, based on true events. Oh, brother, June thought. Great, I thought it was a nice story, and then they dropped the B-O-T-E, based on true events bomb on me. June got hungry, but she prepared. She brought two sandwiches with orange juice and a neat lunchbox. She ate one sandwich and headed home. Except, while walking home, something felt off. The outdoors looked calm, but the soft chirps of birds stopped. The wind wasn't blowing, and she felt as if she was being watched, even though no one was there. Even when she turned to look somewhere, she realized she had been walking for a while now. Wait, am I lost? I have been walking for over 10 minutes now, June said to herself calmly. She began to walk back to the tree. Strangely enough, after 20 minutes of walking, she never got to the tree. Okay, that's not normal. Back at home. Honey, have you seen June? She's been gone for a while now, June's mom said. Uh, no. I think she'll be back soon, though, June's dad said. Back to June. June was slightly concerned now. She was in a field of grass, with absolutely no noise or sound of life. Hello? Does anyone hear me? June yelled, but no response. It was kind of freaky. Let me check my supplies and surroundings. I got a nameless book, one sandwich a small juice box, two hairpins, a watch, and a phone. I am surrounded by utter silence and grass with flowers. June said, Wait, I can just call my parents. June said happily. No signal, which was strange. June decided to walk, still having a feeling of being watched. Even when she looked at her watch, it stopped working. June had assumed it had been two hours, but the sun was still high up in the air. Was June lost? 
or trapped back at home. 911, what's your emergency? My daughter June hasn't returned home and it's almost midnight. She left at 1 p.m. to read and hasn't come back, June's mom said, panicking. Okay, ma'am, do you know where your daughter is? No idea, but she usually reads under a tree in a giant field. Okay, ma'am, where is your address? 412 St. George's Lane. We'll send someone right away. Back to June. June was very confused and scared now. She had been endlessly walking forever now. She was starting to lose the concept of time because the sun was still up and it seemed like she was walking forever. Then she heard a noise for the first time since she got lost. Yes, I hear some wildlife, June said cheerfully. If there was wildlife, there must be people. It was a bird, but its left wing was ripped off by something evil. Aww, poor little bird. June was upset that it was one injured bird, but she was glad she could talk to something. June got hungry and decided to eat little pieces of her sandwich and fed some to the bird. She was getting hot from the sun and really wanted some shade or something cold. Looking ahead, she saw something and dashed towards it. So she was pretty disappointed to discover that it was the same stupid tree she had came around to eight hours ago. But something about that bugged her. She didn't go in a giant circle. She went in a straight line. June had assumed she wandered for 10 hours, but in reality, two days had passed. June had finished all her lunch and was hungry. She looked at her bird. Oh no, I can't. I shouldn't, June said to herself. But a strange voice in her head, sounding ominous, said, Do it. You know you're starving. It wasted some of your food, and you love eating chicken. A bird is the same thing. Then, the voice repeated itself slightly faster and louder. Do it! You know you're starving. It wasted some of your food, and you love eating chicken. A bird is the same thing. June took a deep breath and killed the bird by hitting it repeatedly again and again and again. She ate it like a lion, tearing it apart and even crunching the bones of it. June loved it. (laughs) I'm having such a blast, she said in a cheerful, demonic voice. June was sick of running. That was tiring. She decided to walk casually and hum her favorite song. Two weeks later, June had many gruesome cuts around her. She needed any source of drinkable fluid. Her dress and shoes were torn apart from walking tirelessly. She had lost all concept of time and slept under anything she could find. Then she saw something. A figure in the distance. Could she finally be free? Yes. Yes, is that a person? Finally. I need to get their attention. June whistled and it echoed. But the figure was fading away. No, 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 come come back, back. please. June screamed as loud as possible, sounding hurt. June was all alone. She knew there were other people, though. She had wandered forever, it seemed. One year later. June wasn't dead. She had suffered what seemed forever. She went insane, talking to grass, eating dirt, grass, flowers, and parts of her body. She gave up until... (sighs) Huh? Yes! Another human! I'm coming! June ran and ran towards the dark figure, waving her hand frantically and jumping. She was smiling. She was finally going to be rescued. Yes, Yes. over Over here, here. please Please come. come. It started getting closer. June realized the human looks not human, like... Wait a minute. 
The shadow runs towards June and yells a demonic scream. Ah! Help! Help! June tried to run, but it became night. She heard the running get closer and closer and it caught her. June is scared, but happy. Finally, maybe in death, I can escape this place. Back home, two years later. June, wake up. It's 12 p.m. You never sleep this late, June's mother said. What? What? Was it a dream? June said, looking at herself. No cuts. Silly bear. Did you have a nightmare? It's fine. Just come eat breakfast. After breakfast, June's mom asked June a question. June, sweetie, could you be a dear and get me an extra large pan in the- No! June screamed. I- I mean, no, mom. I I'm reading. June was glad it was a dream, but then... She didn't realize that it wasn't a dream. She was having a mirage. She was stuck forever. She can't escape. Not even in death. Addison De La Rosa, age 12, The Haunted Diner Nearly 100 years ago, a small diner located in New Jersey closed due to the owner and staff dying of an unknown disease. Now, in current day New Jersey, a family of four search for a place to eat on a dark, stormy autumn day. They find an old diner one that they previously thought was closed. But the lights were on, and people were inside, so it must be open, right? This place is gross, exclaimed 13-year-old Tyler as he stepped out of the car and stared up at the building in disgust. Don't be such a baby, remarked his 18-year-old sister Susan as she followed him to the entrance. Their mother rolled her eyes as she, along with her husband, exited the car and locking it before joining their two children. Enough, you two. We're here to have an enjoyable evening, not to argue, she said. They pulled open the door and walked in. Tyler first. The first thing they noticed was the dust and cobwebs that coated most of the tables and floor. The other people there were finishing up their meals and preparing to leave. They took a seat at one of the tables near the front dusting off the surface, but not daring to look below. Susan let out a screech when she felt something brush past her leg, immediately jumping up after she sat down. Ew! There is a spider under there! Get it, Tyler, get it! Susan was terrified of spiders. Tyler peered under the table for several seconds before resurfacing. There's nothing there, Susan. Calm down. Sheesh he said as he resumed his position. Although Susan managed to calm down, she felt uneasy. A waitress emerged from the back room, breaking the silence with her sharp voice as she asked the family what they wanted to eat. Both children ordered cheeseburgers with soft drinks and the parents spaghetti. The father ordered black coffee for his drink while the mother chose a soft drink. I'll be right out with your food, the waitress said, leaving the table heading towards the back room. Did you notice her face? Tyler said, squirming in his seat. It was all twisted. Motioning his hands to indicate the waitress's face. Her eyes were almost on her forehead and her mouth nearly on her chin. By now, the rest of the diner was empty. The few people there earlier had paid and left. While the rest of the family waited patiently for the waitress to come back with their food, Tyler could not stop moving. He got up to use the restroom, slowing as he neared the kitchen, stopping altogether as he reached the kitchen doorway. What he saw made him sick to his stomach. The chef was standing over a pot, chanting and waving while throwing things in. Suddenly, the chef snapped her head toward Tyler revealing owl-like features with slitted yellow eyes and a sharp nose and mouth. Get out, you worm! 
the cook yelled at Tyler, resulting in him hitting his head as he tried to turn and run. He recovered quickly, running back to his table. He tried to warn his family he really did, but they would not listen. Susan even elbowed him, accusing him of trying to scare her. The chef herself brought the food, accompanied by the waitress. Before they reached the table, lightning flashed and thunder boomed, shaking the building and causing the lights to go out. When the lights turned back on, the chef and waitress were standing at the table, holding food in front of them. The family thanks them, and they disappear to the back of the diner. The father takes a long drink of his coffee, savoring it in his mouth before he swallows. Then he takes a bite of his spaghetti. He spits it out all over the table. It's full of dirt, he exclaims as he wipes the food off his mouth and shirt. Everyone looks down at their food. The mother, seeing worms, Tyler, brains, and Susan, frogs. The lights go out once again. The chef and waitress are nowhere to be found. In fact, the diner never reopened. The family finds themselves in an old, broken-down diner. Windows shattered and lights flickering. The End Lila J. Olguin, age 13 Sitting by the riverbank again, I see. The voice startled Alice, awake from her daydreams. Just bored, Alice replies, silently hoping her sister would go away, so she could go back to daydreaming. Just before her sister startled her, she was dreaming of the infamous Wonderland that had been haunting her the moment she climbed back out of the rabbit hole. She missed the thrill and excitement, as well as the people she met along the way. It made her wonder how they were doing, right at this very moment. Maybe you should read something. It lets your brain wander into imaginary lands, her sister said, with a slight smile, and handed Alice a book. I don't want to read, Alice thought miserably, turning the book in her hands. She wanted to be in an imaginary land. Alice's sister must have noticed Alice's disappointment because she started explaining how books are fun. Alice didn't believe a word as she handed the book back to her sister. I want to go to Wonderland again. Alice's sister sighed at this. She remembered about a year ago, Alice had dreamt up an imaginary world that she then told her sister about when she woke up. There is no such thing as Wonderland, Alice's sister said. Only a place of wonder. No, I swear there is a wonderland, Lorena. Alice groaned, annoyed about her sister's need to crush her dreams. Lorena just shook her head slowly and turned to walk away. No, wait, Lorena. Alice called, making her sister stop in her tracks. You don't believe me, right? Lorena once again shook her head slowly. Well... How about I show you? Alice smiled proudly and got up. Lorena didn't have the energy to say no, so she just silently followed Alice. Here, Alice said a little too proudly, looking down. What is it? Lorena asked, walking towards her sister, who had her back turned from her. Lorena looked at what her sister was looking at. She saw a rabbit hole that went very deep into the ground. Don't tell me this is what you jumped into, Lorena said, rolling her eyes at her sister's idiocy. Alice didn't reply, eyes only on the rabbit hole. Alice? Lorena asked as she stepped in front of her sister, careful to avoid not falling into the rabbit hole. Alice, are you okay? What? Oh, yes. It's nothing, just deja vu. Alice smiled. All right then, Lorena said skeptically. She turned back to face the hole. What do we do now? We jump in, Alice said excitedly, eyes sparkling with happiness. What? No, we are so not jumping in that. Before Lorena could even finish her sentence, 
Her oblivious sister jumps in. Alice, no! Lorena yells down the hole. No answer. Oh my god, I hate her so much. She mumbles as she jumps into the hole. When they were falling, she had no idea of what was going on and whether she was falling really slow or the rabbit hole was just really long. But when she glanced down, she could see her sister's familiar blue dress. Lorena swims in midair, using the walls to get closer to her sister, who seemed to be enjoying this fall more than her. Alice! Lorena yells over the rush of air in her ears. Yes? Alice said, crossing her arms under her head to look like she was on a beach vacation and not falling in a never-ending rabbit hole. When does the fall stop? Lorena asked. Soon, Alice said, yawning, as this was a normal thing. They eventually reached the bottom and landed on a pile of dry leaves. All right, Alice said, getting up way too quickly to be healthy. Onwards! Alice! Lorena called after her as she shook the dry leaves off her dress. Do you even know what you are doing? Of course I do, Lorena! Alice said with a smile. She then walked up to a table that Lorena didn't see before and stopped in her tracks. She picked up a note from the flat surface of the table and read it, eyes growing wider and wider by the second. What's wrong, Alice? Lorena asked, stalking closer to her sister, who was as still as a stone. There... there's nothing on the table, Alice said, quickly tucking away the note into her pocket with a fake smile. Is there supposed to be? Lorena didn't like it when Alice kept secrets, but she knew her sister might have been down here before, so she had all trust of Alice. Well, yes, there is supposed to be a golden key. Sure, Lorena said, no longer having trust in her sister. What was the note? She held out her hand, palm facing up. Nothing, I swear! Alice shrieked, backing away. Fine, Lorena thought, dropping her hand. What happens now? Lorena asked, hoping the next answer would be to go home. I don't know, Alice said, peeking behind a curtain. Oh wait, it's okay because the door is open already. As Alice said that, a little bottle with the bold words saying drink me on it popped out of nowhere and was on the table. Wow, now that's cool, Lorena said in awe. You get used to it, Alice said with a shrug. They both approached the table. We are going to drink half of it, all right? Alice said, then suddenly remembered. Oh yeah, she grabbed the golden key. Don't want to forget this like last time. They both drank half, and they both shrank enough to fit into the tiny door. Awesome! Lorena gushed. She looked under the table where she saw a tiny glass box. Alice, what's that? Don't eat it! It makes us grow, then we can't fit through the door! Alice said, rolling her eyes as if it was the most obvious thing. They walked through the garden that was beyond the door, stopping occasionally to look at the marvels around them. Once they got through, they knew they were now in Wonderland. Wow, Lorena said, twirling to look all around her. I feel like I'm at a theme park. She looks towards the forest. Let's go in there, Lorena said, already setting off. No! Alice said, a little too loudly. Let's just go in that house right there. She points towards a house and walks towards it, cautiously looking around as she pushed her sister in. What's wrong, Alice? Just a second ago, you were so excited to be here. Now you're all, hurry up, Lorena said, crossing her arms and looking at Alice. I just don't want you to get distracted, Alice said putting her hand in her dress pocket and clutching the letter she had picked up. What's with the letter? 
please tell me, Lorena pleaded. Alice handed Lorena the letter, and Lorena took it gratefully. Inside the letter wrote, We are all mad here. What does that mean? Lorena asked, shaken up a bit by the letter. It means... But Alice's words were cut off by a smashing noise, like someone broke the window. Alice, Lorena whispered. What was that? I don't know. Alice whispered back, frozen with fear. There was a creak upstairs, as if someone was putting all their weight on one foot. Alice and Lorena looked at each other, fear filling both their eyes. Lorena bent down to touch the floor. As she brought her hand up, her finger was covered in blood. Oh my god, Alice whispered, bringing her hand up to cover her mouth. You shouldn't have come back, Alice. A sing-song voice coming from the stairs said. A creak was then heard right after the voice stopped coming from the stairs. Alice frantically looked at her sister, hoping she would think of something. Lorena dived and grabbed Alice to the corner of the room, where Lorena ripped a curtain rod and gripped it well in her hands. Alice looked around for a weapon as well and settled on a broom she found right next to her. What are we going to do? Alice whispered whimpering slightly. She now regretted coming back to Wonderland. We need to run, Lorena whispered back. But we can't unless we get rid of the person in this house. She turned to Alice, knowing what she had to do. Alice shook her head. Don't, Lorena. You could die. I have to, if it means you will be able to escape, Lorena whispered and smiled slightly. Why did Lorena want to murder herself suddenly? But... Alice started, but was cut off by the sing-song voice. Come out, come out, wherever you are. The sing-song voice hummed. A creak was then followed by it once again. This time, it seemed closer to them. Lorena looked at Alice and smiled slightly with tears in her eyes. Alice shook her head, tears also in her eyes. Please, she whispered. Bad timing. There was a sudden hit, steel to wood, making both sisters scream. There you are, said the voice. It took Alice a while to recognize him, but there he was. The white rabbit, standing right in front of her, an axe in hand his eyes having now turned a possessive white and his fur stained with blood, his pocket watch no longer its charming self, the glass broken and the clock no longer ticking. Lorena was the first to recover herself. She stood up and hit the rabbit with her curtain rod. It might have sent him back a few steps, but not enough to bolt for the door that was at least 20 feet away from Alice. You shouldn't have done that, the white rabbit said, wiping blood from his mouth where Lorena had landed her hit. It was terrifying to look at him, and even when Alice looked at her sister, who had a brave face on, she could still see the fear in her eyes. The white rabbit stalked closer and grabbed the axe that was stuck in the wood when he missed them. Alice immediately regretted not grabbing the axe when she had a chance and got up from the floor. Both the sisters' hearts were racing as they waited for the next move the rabbit might make. Lorena was about to go for the next hit with her curtain rod, but the rabbit stopped it mid-air. Not going to happen again, the rabbit growled as he snapped the rod in half. Lorena immediately backed away, but not swift enough. The white rabbit swung his axe and it hit the side of Alice's sister. Alice cried out as the impact made an awful sound of metal to flesh and used the top of the broom to drag it into the rabbit's white eye, using all her might not to look at her sister. The rabbit immediately dropped the axe, but it was still stuck in the side of Lorena's body as she fell to the ground. Alice pressed the broom handle further into the rabbit's eye until she saw it stick out at the back of his head. 
She focused all her anger, sadness, and disgust into the broom until she no longer heard the dying, wailing of the rabbit. She dropped the broom and the rabbit fell with it, frozen in death. Alice then turned around and kneeled beside her sister. Lorena! Alice yelled, shaking her sister awake. The wound looked pretty bad and Lorena was losing a lot of blood. No, please don't let this be happening, Alice thought as tears streamed down her face. Please, please, please. When Alice no longer saw blood leaking from her sister's body, she allowed herself to break. She screamed and screamed until there was no more voice left in her. She didn't care if more monsters came. No, she only cared to be there for her sister. Right then, right now. Alice looked at her sister again, sobs shaking her ribcage. Then her sister's eyes opened so suddenly, it made Alice jump back. L- Lorena? Alice said, wiping the tears from her eyes and sniffing. She scanned Lorena's eyes. Alice reeled back so far she slammed her back into the stairs. That was not her sister. At least, not anymore. Lorena's eyes were white, just like the rabbit's ones were. The night sky sparkled with stars, space a big wonder to the people who lived to look up and explore. The stars winked and danced across the sky, basking people in their wonderful glow as the moon smiled like a Cheshire cat. Too bad the people of Wonderland never got to look up into the sky again. Their souls were added to the stars, each star representing each person they lost. That must have explained why there were so many stars above Wonderland. If curiosity killed the cat, what did Wonder do? I'll tell you what Wonder did. Wonder tore Alice's body until she was no longer Alice, but organs and dead flesh left there to rot until the world ends. Wonder was what Lorena roamed in for the rest of her eternal death, like a zombie. Wonder is what turned the trees black and twisted, the plant dead and the people who lived rotten. That's what wonder did to people. That's what wonder always did. So remember, there is no such thing as Wonderland. Only a place for wonder. Aiden De La Rosa, age 13. There I stood, frozen with fear, utterly terrified of what I saw in front of me. It couldn't possibly be real. And yet, there it was, walking towards me, dragging a bloody corpse, its eyes a deep void, black as coal. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm Michael, and I'm 17. Let me take you back to where and when this all started. It was a cool Monday afternoon, almost evening in mid-October. Colorful leaves flittered down around my face as I rode my bike home from school. I was there serving detention for hitting another student. I'm not sure why I hit him. I didn't know him and had no reason to. I didn't even really hurt him. I landed a quick jab to the stomach as he passed me in the hall. It wouldn't have been a big deal, except for the teacher was standing right there watching the whole thing. My parents would be furious, not because it resulted in a suspension or even expulsion, but because my younger brother Charles might find out what I did. Charles was their little angel. He could do no wrong in their eyes. Charles looked up to me for some reason. Maybe it was because he thought I was cool. Maybe just because I was his older brother. I'm not sure, but what I am sure of is that my parents hated it because I had a tendency to get in trouble. When I entered my neighborhood, I hopped off my bike walking the rest of the way. My house was the first on the block. I walked my bike through the backyard and entered through the screen door, hoping no one would notice. I tried to slip undetected past the kitchen, where I saw my mom cleaning up dinner dishes. I barely got a few steps past the entrance before my mother spotted me. Why are you so late? She demanded. Was that concern that filled her voice? Worry that I saw in her face? 
If it was, it was only there for a moment, and then her expression turned cold. Your dinner got cold, so I threw it out. If you don't want it to happen again, get here on time. This was just another way to punish me. When she turned her back, I quickly grabbed an apple and ran to my room. When I pushed the door open, I was blinded by a bright flash. I recovered enough to see Charles holding a camera as he fled to his room at the end of the hallway. I'll get him later, I thought, too tired to do anything at the moment. I flopped down on my bed and must have fallen asleep because the next thing I remember is my father shaking me awake, telling me that he and my mother were going out. Of course, that meant I'd have to watch Charles again. I really didn't want to have to put up with him tonight. I turned on the television in his room and set him up with snacks so he wouldn't bother me. I didn't want him to interfere with my plans to meet up with some friends at the local museum later, that night, after it was closed. It wasn't 20 minutes later that I found him asleep on his bed, dead to the world. Perfect, I thought, as I sneaked out of the house, riding my bike to meet my friends. I didn't notice my brother following me, some distance behind. When I got there, my friends were waiting at an open window for the security guard to do his final rounds. We waited until the security guard left and snuck in through the window, which was left open to clear the museum's musty smell. Again, I don't know why I broke in. It's not like we were going to steal anything. We split up, making our way through the dark halls and around the creepy exhibits. Nothing breaking the darkness but our flashlights. I ended up on the second floor, in the Native American history exhibit. I found myself looking eerily at the depiction marked Wendigo. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end as I read the description. An Algonquin spirit which could turn people into cannibalistic creatures that feed on human flesh. I heard the floor creak behind me, and I quickly turned around, seeing a dark figure lurking in the shadows. It rushed towards me, and I threw my hands up in front of my face instinctually shoving it away from me. Whatever it was fell backwards over the railing to the bottom floor. I peered over the railing, shining my light down. What I saw filled me with dread, causing a knot in the pit of my stomach. It was the broken, bloody body of my brother. I ran down the stairs, stumbling to his side. I turned, yelling for my friends. When I turned back, my brother's body was gone. My friends ran up asking what happened. I explained as best I could, pointing to where my brother's body had been. They separated in search for my brother, each going in different directions. I stood there a few moments, sobbing, watching the darkness envelop them, before I started my own search for him. I got no more than a few steps before I heard a blood-curdling scream in the distance somewhere to my right. I ran towards the scream, hoping to find my brother. Instead, I found my friend's lifeless body laying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. I turned him over and saw what looked like a huge gash torn in his throat. I lurched backwards, hearing another scream behind me. I turned round and seeing another one of my friends stumbling out of the darkness holding his blood-soaked stomach, his intestines falling out. He fell to the floor as a shadowy figure emerged from the darkness behind him. Its thin, pale, and emaciated body stood tall above me. Its bloody, claw-like hands held my brother's lifeless body, its mouth and face covered with his blood as it takes another tearing bite with its jagged, knife-like teeth. It threw the body aside, trying to grab me. I screamed, all thoughts of my friends forgotten. I struggled to find an exit. I had dropped my flashlight in my haste to escape the thing, so now I was stumbling around in the dark. After circling around in an attempt to lose the thing, I found myself back in the lobby, hearing a sharp crash behind me, but not daring to look back. I rushed towards the glass door, only to find it locked. Suddenly... A searing pain shot through my back, and my shirt became soaked in my own warm blood. Then, there was nothing but darkness.
Thanks for listening, and thank you so much to all of my junior horror authors who sent in their stories this year, and thank you so much to their adults who took the time to send them in as well. I cannot wait to see what you come up with next year. Every year, I'm blown away. Several of you have been writing for the kids' episodes for years, and I've gotten to see you grow into many Stephen Kings. And don't worry, I've decided next year I'm going to bring back the teen episode because a couple of you are going to be aging out of this kids' episode, and you'll be moving on to the teen spirits episode. And adults, if you'd like to send in a story next year for your junior horror author in your life, then you can send it to scareyoutosleep at gmail.com. But hold off and don't worry, every year I announce on the show and on social media when I will be accepting submissions each year and again, when the deadline will be. And I have to stick real firm to those deadlines, so I am so sorry if anyone out there listening didn't quite make the deadline this year. And that's scareyoutosleep at gmail.com. And if you'd like to follow along on social media, it's at scareyoutosleep, all one word, on all the socials. All right, everyone, again, a huge thank you to my junior horror authors. You all did a fantastic job, and some of you really scared the pants off me. Good night, and happy Halloween.